Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's continue our discussion of migraine. We're going to add new information. If you would kindly, at your leisure, watch the first show. You'll learn about the symptoms of migraine. Now we're going on. There's the post after the headache goes away. You don't get better just right away. What you do is you have up to a 24-hour period where you're tired or irritable. You have some muscle weakness or lack of appetite. Some people actually crave foods or are euphoric or feel unusually refreshed. But more often, there's malaise and lethargy. Sometimes there's actually return of the headache for seconds to a moment when you cough or move your head. That's what we call the migraine hangover. There's a genetic component to migraine headaches so that if one parent suffers the condition, you have about a 40% chance. Both parents, you have about a 75% chance. And if an identical twin has it, eh, chances are you're going to get it. There's a problem with chronic migraines. Most of the time we think about migraines as episodic. You have fewer than 15 headache days a month. But some people develop chronic migraine. About 2% of the people go from the episodic to the chronic migraine family every year. In the chronic migraine family, you have more than 15 headache days a month, more than eight migraine headaches days a month. And oftentimes, you develop the chronic migraine because you overuse the medicines for the acute migraine. And that's a very common situation. It's more common in women than men. The average age people who develop the condition is about 45. Unfortunately, with chronic migraine, it's very difficult to get back to your baseline. It tends to have a relatively poor outcome. So you want to avoid that if you can. So be careful about your medicine, but take it when it's necessary. The pediatric population, we have something known as a migraine equivalent. Migraine equivalent could be benign positional vertigo when the child turns his head or her head, gets a little bit dizzy for a while. Happens every time you turn the head. Abdominal migraine is a common migraine equivalent where there's abdominal pain or nausea or gas. Sometimes there's bloating or loose stools or even constipation. When should you see a doctor if you have migraine? Well, you should see a doctor if the symptoms are atypical. If the aura lasts for more than 60 minutes, if you have an unusually severe headache or you have fever, or you have persistent headache in between the attacks, or you have new onset of a migraine over age 50, or the duration of the headaches is more than 72 hours, or you have problems seeing or problems speaking that lasts for more than an hour, or if you have a sudden onset of headache with other neurologic symptoms or it awakens you from sleep, all of those require you seeing a doctor. So too, if you have a history of cancer, if it's the worst headache you've ever had, if you have a rigid neck or if you have progressive motor weakness, those might be signs of a stroke or some other kind of important condition. See a doctor. How often do you need to have some sort of neuroimaging, an MRI, a CAT scan? Not really appropriate unless there's another reason, not just for the migraine headache. The likelihood of people with routine migraine headaches having any other kind of condition that would show up on an MRI or a CAT scan, very low. And same too with electroencephalograms. You don't need them. The concept of how does migraine start, it was originally thought to be due to a vascular problem. Vascular problem meaning the blood vessels were dilated or constricted. But that really hasn't held up. Now the new concept is that it's a sensory processing disorder. And it seems that you have abnormal activity in the central nervous system. And it's that abnormal activity that leads to the migraine, not really the blood vessels either being dilated or shrunken. And it seems that the migraine headaches are associated with abnormal activity in the hypothalamus and the thalamus and the brainstem and the cortex, associated with abnormalities in the neurotransmitters, maybe as far as glutamate is concerned. We know that CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide, has something to do with the migraine headaches. And a lot of the newer medicines, the fancier medicines, the most expensive medicines, target the CGRP in one way or another. Pregnancy is an issue with migraine. We don't want the therapy to be worse than the condition we're trying to treat. We don't want to have any effect on the unborn fetus. 
We know that migraine by itself is unlikely to be associated with problems. There's a small increase in incidence of hypertension in pregnancy and preeclampsia, but it's relatively small. The question is, how do we treat in pregnancy? Individual, talk to your neurologist and your obstetrician. There are certain risk factors, or what we call trigger factors. And the trigger factors are things that you do that seem to trigger the migraine, like consuming monosodium glutamate or peanut butter or chocolate or bananas or fermented foods or aged cheese or red wine or, for some people, birth control pill or hormone replacement therapy. Triggers can be associated with your lifestyle. So if you drink too much caffeine, if you miss a meal, if you have allergies, you're exposed to brighter flickering lights, you're anxious or depressed, you have physical or emotional stress, or maybe you don't sleep well, or you're in a smoky room. All of those seem to decrease the threshold. They don't really cause the migraine itself, but they decrease the brain's threshold so that the abnormal activity now breaks through. And when it does, that's when you get the migraine. Well, it's important to realize that if you have migraine, you want to keep your schedule relatively constant. You want to get adequate amount of sleep. You want to minimize the amount of stress, drink adequate amount of liquid. You want to avoid the foods that seem to be able to precipitate the condition. You want to engage in regular physical activity because it seems that exercise might decrease the frequency of migraines by every bit as much as some of the preventive medicines. There's behavioral therapy and cognitive therapy that helps for some people. The idea that you could go to the emergency room and they'd give you a shot of morphine or Demerol, give you a prescription for the opioids, that's kind of passe now. doesn't happen because there are restrictions on all of these medicines. By the same token, some people, when they take birth control pills or hormone replacement therapy or even use nasal decongestant, may precipitate the problem. So be alert to things that you do that might trigger a migraine and then obviously try to avoid them. Well, if you treat a migraine headache relatively early, not after it's been around for six hours or eight hours, but if you treat it early on, it seems to be much better. It responds much better. On the other hand, if you use too much of the medicine, if you take too much of the tryptans or the opioids that you shouldn't take or the ergotamine type preparations, or even if you take too much aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or acetaminophen, you might develop the chronic migraine, the medicine overuse headache. That can happen with just take more than 15 days of the drugs, the over-the-counter drugs, more than 10 days a month of the prescription drugs. So you do want to be relatively careful. So what is the treatment for an acute migraine headache? For some people, it can be nothing more than an aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen, acetaminophen. Works for a significant number. But the standard therapy right now, if you have a migraine headache and you don't have any other contraindications, any reason you shouldn't take them, then it's the tryptans. The tryptans, medicines like Imitrex, Sumatriptan, or Zomig, or Maxalt, or Emerge, or Frova, or Relpax, or Axert, all of these medicines seem to work. They work about the same. They all work relatively well. They're relatively inexpensive now compared to some of the other therapies. Problem is that insurance companies tend to limit the number of medicines that you can have, the number of pills that you can have. Most of the trials were in people who already were suffering from moderate to severe pain, and those people on trial didn't do nearly as well as the people who took the medicine sort of in a preemptory fashion. So when the headache starts, that's when you should be taking the medicines. That's when they seem to abort the headache most often. Well, side effects of the tryptans, sure they have side effects. They can cause some chest tightness, they can cause some lightheadedness or nausea or dizziness, feel like your limbs are heavy, cause some tingling, and if you happen to have a history of vascular disease, coronary artery disease, basal spastic disease, 
you've had a stroke, you've had some angina, these drugs probably are not for you. And they're not for people who have the basal or migraine. They're not for people who have the vertigo or the ringing in the ears, the tinnitus, or the difficulty walking or speaking, problem with consciousness, decreased consciousness. Triptan's not for you. And the triptans seem not to work as well if you're obese or if you have hypertension or if you have depression. But it seems that all of the triptans work pretty well. It all depends how you take them. Some are pills, some you can uh, take intranasally, others you can inject yourself, some are rectal suppositories. Work differently for different people. And we know that the speed of the medicine working has to do to large measure with how it's taken. But remember, the earlier you take it seems to be the better. But if you take it before the headache starts, so if you take it when you have an aura, it's not going to help. So you have to wait till you get the headache for the aura. Maybe you take an aspirin or something like that. We have medicines available to treat the nausea and the vomiting, medicines like chlorpromazine or Reglan. They seem to work pretty well. And as a matter of fact, oftentimes, if we can get rid of the nausea and the vomiting, that's the major complaint. Oftentimes, people complain of the nausea and vomiting more than the headache. Well... Do we have other medicines? We have the ergot preparations, the DHG. These can be taken orally or injected. They're used for resistant migraines. They have some side effects. And again, you shouldn't take them if you have coronary artery disease. And then we have some of the brand new medicines. We have Ubrelvi that was approved just in December of 2019 and Nurtec in February of 2020. Those drugs are expensive. They cost about $100 cash per pill. You can get them with special kind of copay cards and all of that. They work modestly better than a placebo, but they're certainly not a home run. They work on the CGRP, that chemical we talked about. Then there's another one, and it's called Rayval. The FDA just approved that in October of 2019. It's also quite expensive. It's the first drug in its family. It works on the serotonin receptors. And it seems to work basically about as well as Ubrelvi and Nurtec. Don't have any problem if you have vascular disease, so that's relatively good. But unfortunately, if you take the medicine, then you shouldn't drive for about eight hours afterward because it can make you sleepy. Well, how about preventive therapy? Well, if you happen to have more than two migraine headache days a month, I'm sorry, if you have more than two days of migraine a week or more than two migraines per month, then you should consider the appropriateness of taking some sort of preventive therapy. Well, the likelihood of preventive therapy working is mild to moderate. So you can take a beta blocker like propranolol or timolol or an antidepressant like Amitriline or Effexor, or you could take an anticonvulsant like Valproate or Tomipramate. And, and those drugs seem to work relatively well. But it, again, they're not home runs. Gabapentin, very frequently used, but probably inappropriate for the overwhelming majority of people, and all the studies were done by the drug company or sponsored by the drug company. Tegretol doesn't seem to work. Lamitrogene doesn't seem to work. Prozac, it's equivocal, probably not. The idea about using some of the calcium blockers like verapamil recently been downgraded. So prevention of migraine, chronic migraine, Botox might work, but again, only works a little bit better than placebo. Some people take herbs or vitamins, feverfew or butterbur or magnesium citrate or riboflavin B2 or vitamin B12 or melatonin or some coenzyme Q10. Some of those have been tried, not in really appropriate studies, but some of them have been tried and found to be a little bit helpful. Preventive therapy can decrease the migraines by about one to two and a half headache days per month. The success is relatively modest. Now we have some of the new fancy drugs that work on that CGRP, the Amavig and the Agivy or the Emgality. 
those drugs are also quite expensive. They can be taken relatively infrequently by injection. But the question is, do they really represent a significant step forward over the other medicines that we have that were cheap and used for other purposes, that were what we call repurposed? And the answer is, for the overwhelming majority of people, they're not necessary. Well, you should consider the preventive therapy if you have chronic history of migraine, if you have migraines more than either a couple days a week or a couple migraines a month. Pregnant women, mm, it's difficult, difficult, difficult story. Certainly ice and rest, always the first choice, and then maybe some of the non-steroidals or the acetaminophen, maybe that can be quite sufficient. Some people get injections of Ketrolac or there are other medicines that are available in Europe, not available in the United States. Exercise, as I mentioned, can decrease the frequency of recurrent migraines as much as any of the prescription medicines. The idea of a patent foramen ovale, the hole in between the right and the left heart, well, people have argued about that for a long time. Is this the cause of the slight increase in stroke related to the migraine? And the answer is, mm, maybe, maybe not. Anyway, that's the story about migraine. That's where we stand right now. It's a very common condition. Unfortunately, we don't have yet the best understanding of the disease. And because we don't have the best understanding, we lack the most appropriate therapy. But hopefully, hopefully, there will be something new in the relatively near future. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. Appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.